All right. Welcome, everyone. It is noon, so we're going to get things kicked off here with Rocky Mountaineer. We have Dawn here with us today to tell you all the latest and greatest about Rocky Mountaineer products and their different itineraries. And I know I'm excited. I'll be heading on the U.S. route in September, so I will be reporting back to all of you to let you know more about my experience. And I will let Dawn take things away. Thank you so much for being here today. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Yes, my name's Dawn. I'm business development for Rocky Mountaineer. I'm, I'm keeping my video off today because they're having some um, technical issues. And sometimes when things become choppy, I find that keeping off camera, just letting the computer do its work is, is a little best. So how it's going to work today is I'm going to tell you about Rocky Mountaineer and who we are, what makes us unique. I'll talk about our rail services. I'll talk about our routes, both in Canada and the U.S., and then we'll finish with some promo. So let's get started. Welcome aboard Rocky Mountaineer. Who are we? We have been around for over 30 years, I think 33 years now. And for over 30 years, we've been taking people from around the world on just remarkable journeys through the Canadian Rockies. And now, as Kelly and I talked about, if you were on a little early, uh, we're in the U.S. as well and so excited about that. We've really become known for our luxurious coaches, our fresh, flavorful food, our engaging host, just a really unique product. Because you know what? You could drive these areas both in Canada and the U.S. and it would be beautiful. You are not going to see them the way you see them on board Rocky Mountaineer. I mean, look at this picture. You are really right, obviously, on the train tracks, but you are going through the mountains, over the crevasses, the canyons. You will see sites on every single route of ours that you cannot see if you, if you were to drive this. It's inaccessible by car. So as I mentioned, as we were kind of chit-chatting chit a little early, um, three things make Rocky Mountaineer unique, not just from any rail company, but honestly, any other tour operator as well. Uh, first one is day on board the train. We are daylight only train travel. Uh, one of the biggest misconceptions I get is where do you sleep on the train? And you don't, um, unless you have a little bit of that, too much of that free alcohol that we offer on board the train, then you might doze off a little bit. Uh, but for the most part, uh, we're daylight only train travel. We're always overnighting in great hotels, then getting back on the train the next day. World-class cuisine, that's the other thing that makes us unique. And you might be thinking, well, how good could train food be in I am here to tell you, it's unbelievable. Uh, we truly do win award upon award upon award for our food. And the next one, the third thing that makes us unique are our engaging hosts. Of course, our hosts are there to serve you. They're there to cater to your needs, um, but they're also great storytellers. So they're there to tell you the history of the area, the sites that you're coming up to, uh, the human interest stories. Those are my favorite. And they're fabulous animal spotters. So they actually carry walkie-talkies with them and earpieces. So if anybody on the train spots an animal, they hear about it. And all of a sudden, they, it's so funny because, you know, they'll just, they'll just be riding along, maybe telling you a story. And all of a sudden, they're pouring a glass of wine and you hear them, you know, yell out, bear on the right. And everybody screams and jumps up and runs to take a picture of the bear. And that's where it becomes a fun social interaction. Because trust me, once that big bear or... Bighorn sheep or mountain lion, bald eagle is spotted. Everybody starts getting into it and it, it becomes really a fun social interaction then. So those are the three things that make us unique. Daylight only train travel, world-class cuisine, and our engaging host. Your job, it's simple. Sit back, relax, enjoy the scenery, maybe follow along on our milepost. We have a milepost newsletter and it talks about every one of our routes and you can follow along where you're at and the host will tell you occasionally where we're at on the, on the map as well. And of course, your other main job is to just spot the wildlife. You know, look for that bear, look for that bald eagle, the moose, the elk, uh, really fun to see them in their natural habitat, you know. We share the line freight. We share the lines with freight trains. Freight trains carry feed. Animals come down by the train tracks to to get their food, especially in the spring and the fall, especially when they're coming in and out of hibernation. Okay, so that's a little bit about who we are, and we have two different rail service levels. Um, 
in Canada. So I'm going to talk about Canada right now. Um, two level, two classes of service. The one thing I want you to know, no matter which class of service you pick, it's all inclusive when you're on the train. And I alluded to this a little earlier. Your meals, your snacks, your alcoholic, non-alcoholic beverages are all included on board Rocky Mountaineer, whether you pick Silver Leaf or Gold Leaf. Also, every single rail car, every rail car has its own kitchen and culinary team. That's super important. Your food is prepared right there in your rail car, plated to your preference, brought right out to you. It is not made eight, 10 cars over and it's cold by the time it's brought to you. Um, so every rail car has its own kitchen and culinary team. You can see the differences here between the two. Silver Leaf is a single level rail car and Gold Leaf is a two level rail car. Uh, Silver Leaf is a domed car. It's got some nice wide windows. The dome goes up about a third of the way. Here's a picture of it. This is on our U.S. route, and I'll talk about that in just a, in a little bit. But here's a picture of our Silver Leaf rail car. You can see here people standing up, people turn sideways, plenty of leg room on board Rocky Mountaineer, people standing between the seats to take pictures. And on this rail car, you dine at your seat. So your tray table comes down. We do the whole crystal linen china. Uh, we make a big presentation of it and you have wonderful food. Now, what I really love about our food, it's all locally sourced. So in Canada, for example, the beef is from the Alberta region. The wines are from the Okanagan Wine Valley. The salmon's from the Pacific Northwest. In the US, you will find that uh, we have a little bit of a Southwest flair to it. And we also have some craft brews, of course, from Colorado being kind of the craft brew, brew capital. Uh, you do get a choice, by the way, of two entrees at breakfast and lunch for your Silverleaf rail um, when you're traveling on Silverleaf. People ask you about an outdoor viewing area. Silverleaf does have a little bit of an outdoor viewing area. It uh, This is in between the cars. There's a door there, and we always leave that window open so you can get some fresh air, take some great pictures. It fits about two people on each side. Uh, you can also take great pictures through the window. We have the glass. Very rarely is there any kind of glare back. I've taken some great pictures right from right inside the train car. Uh, so you don't have to go outside to take those pictures. Then in Canada, so Silverleaf is in the US and Canada. In Canada only, we have our Gold Leaf rail car. This is a two level rail car where you sit up top and where that Rocky Mountaineer logo is, you take a spiral staircase down to the main level. Um, I mentioned a spiral staircase. If there's anybody with mobility issues, we do have a lift that goes up and down, but you would have to use it anytime you wanted to come down to the main level, which would be using the washrooms or dining. So this is your, oh, and by the way, the reason we can only bring, uh, the reason we have to leave our gold leaf rail cars in Canada, some of the tunnels that we go through in the United States are too small for those two level rail cars by about seven inches. So, yep, we have to, we have to leave those back at home. Uh, we like them staying two level rail cars. So this is your view from the gold leaf rail car in Canada, 180 degree view of the Canadian Rockies. Um, again, these seats, they're nice wide leather seats. You push a little button and your footrest goes out. Push another one and you kind of slide forward to recline so you don't have to worry about people in front of you or in back of you. Uh, they're heated as well, which is really nice. Uh, even when I've gone in the summer, I love that little seat warmer, just feels so nice and cozy. So that's your view of the Canadian Rockies from your Gold Leaf rail car. So it's a little different on Gold Leaf being a two-level rail car. You go down to the main level to dine restaurant style. Uh, tables of four, two across from each other. Again, both are all inclusive. You know, your meals, snacks, alcoholic, non-alcoholic beverages are included. You do get a choice. I'm going to go back a little bit. You do get a choice of six entrees at breakfast and lunch on your Gold Leaf rail car. Um, and then as a reminder on Silver Leaf, you get a choice of two. And if there's anybody with dietary requests, please let travel leaders know ahead of time when you book. We already have kind of what I call the Fab Four of dietary requests um, on our menu already. We have some gluten-free options, dairy-free, uh, vegetarian, and vegan. So we already have those options available, but if you have any other dietary requests, 
request, please let travel leaders know, and they will tell us. We can handle most dietary requests, but we can't handle them all. We certainly can't handle them if we just find out about it that day. So, okay, the last thing that makes Gold Leaf unique is this outdoor viewing platform. So vestibule probably would fit about 25 of us if we were all to stand side by side. Um, I've been out there with five, six people. I've been out there 20 minutes by myself. People tend to just kind of come and go from this area. You know, maybe get some fresh air, breathe in that fresh, clean mountain air, take some great pictures. I should note the trains both in the U.S. and Canada only go about 30 to 35 miles an hour max on average. So we are not a speed train, a bullet train through Japan. We are a nice leisurely train ride through the Canadian Rockies, 30 to 35 miles an hour max. Um, we at Rocky Mountaineer actually joke, we call it, we go at Kodak speed to uh, because we do slow down that much. Okay, those are our classes of service. Now I'm going to talk about our rail routes and I'll start with Canada. Canada, we have three rail routes, the three solid lines, that green dotted line, there's no rail that goes north and south from Jasper down to Lake Louise, Banff and Calgary. Um, you do the touring by motor coach in that area. But our three rail, rail lines, two go to Jasper, one goes over to Lake Louise and Banff. No matter which one you do, you'll probably either start or end in Vancouver. In fact, not probably, you will start or end in Vancouver. I always recommend extra time in Vancouver, at least one extra day. I love, love, love this city. I truly, truly do. Um, it's one of my top three favorite cities in the world and why I like it so much it's unlike any other city that I've been to. It boasts snow-capped mountains, but yet it has glistening ocean waters as well. It has so many cultural neighborhoods and you can explore them in a variety of, variety of ways by foot, by bike, by motor coach, by water taxi even. So I always recommend an extra day in Vancouver uh, to do some sightseeing. The first route I'm going to talk about is Rainforest to Gold Rush. This is a three-day route to Jasper. Now, you can start and end Vancouver or Jasper. The train goes both ways. It's the same scenery either way. I'm going to talk Vancouver eastbound just for simplicity, basically, and continuity. So you've spent some time in Vancouver. You're going to head to Whistler. Home. You're going to overnight in the White Diamonds. Head to Whistler, home of the 2010 Winter Olympics. You're going to get there around noon and have the rest of the day and the evening there to enjoy Whistler overnight in a hotel. Get up the next day and head towards Quesnel. Now here's where you're gonna notice a big change in topography. In fact, if you're into different sceneries, this is a great route for you because we travel through, um, this is the Fraser Canyon. So you've hit, we call it rainforest to gold rush because you start in Vancouver, which is technically rainforest. You hit the mountains of Whistler, and then when you head up towards Quesnel, which is where the gold rush happened, you can see here the scenery and the topography is quite different. Um, it's more desert-like, more arid. And we do travel through this canyon called the Fraser Canyon. You'll overnight in Quesnel, and then you'll end your rail journey in Jasper, uh, going past sites such as Mount Robson here, the Great White Fright, as the mountain climbers call it and ending your rail journey in Jasper. So as you can see, the rail line is only uh, two or three days long, which is why I'll talk about what you do before and after. Jasper, we have a two-day route as well. So I just talked about rainforest. That was our three-day route. Jasper journey through the clouds is a two-day rail route. Overnighting in Kamloops. Little side note, People always ask me, why Kamloops? Why Quenelle? What's there really to do in those areas? And I'll be honest, there's not a lot. But the reason we overnight there in these places is because we're keeping the integrity of the daylight only train travel going. If we were going from Vancouver to Jasper and we traveled all the way through, when you got past Kamloops, it would start getting dark and you would miss sites like this. Pyramid Falls, probably my favorite site on board Rocky Mountaineer is Pyramid Falls. This is one of those sites that is inaccessible by car. You can only see it on board Rocky Mountaineer. If we kept traveling at night, you wouldn't see it at all. So that's why we have daylight only train travel. That's why we overnight in towns like Kamloops or Quesnel. Uh, so 
Pyramid Falls. I mean, my gosh, can't you just picture yourself with a glass of wine in your hand, looking up at the mountains, the trees, maybe searching for that bald eagle. And then this waterfall comes cascading down over the rocks and the cliffs. It's absolutely stunning. And this is one of those sites that the host will tell you when we're coming up to sites like this, they're going to say, hey, Pyramid Falls is going to be on your right or your left in five or 10 minutes. Get your cameras out. They'll tell you a little bit about it. And then even though the train travels, like I said, on average, 30 to 35 miles an hour, when we come up to this, we are going to slow down to almost a dead stop. So everyone can take pictures, whether they're in the rail car or on the outdoor viewing area, you can take some great pictures. This route again ends in Jasper. Now Jasper surprised me the first time I went. I thought it would be bigger than it was. It's not, it's only a town of about 4,000 people, but it's very natural, I guess would be a word, very kind of rustic, um, kind of untouched is, is how I like to think of Jasper. I have literally seen elk walking down the main street of Jasper. I am not kidding. I was on an early morning jog on the sidewalks of Main Street Jasper, and there is three elk just walking down the main street like they own the place. And from what I hear, that is not uncommon. They pretty much do own the place there. So it's a very unique place to visit. Uh, so those are our two routes to Jasper. We also have a route called First Passage to the West. This is great if any of you are history buffs or train buffs, this is a good one for you. Um, again, overnighting in Kamloops. And then instead of heading northeast to Jasper, we go straight east over to Lake Louise in Kamloops. Or I'm sorry, Lake Louise and Banff. In between Kamloops and Lake Louise are what's called the spiral tunnels. A little bit of background. In the late 1800s, they connected 3,200 kilometers of rail across Canada, essentially making it the country it is today. I mean, the Canadian Rockies were such a huge barrier. However, when they did that, um, the, the grade of the uh, train tracks was about twice as steep as it really should be. Uh, so they couldn't control the speed of the train, which obviously makes for dangerous train travel. So what they did, they brought in engineers from Switzerland. Now, this is early 1900s. We didn't have all the fancy technology we do today. And what they did, they literally blasted through the mountains and created what they call spiral tunnels. I think that's a funny name. They're not even spiral at all. And to me, it sounds like a ride in Disney World or something, the spiral tunnels. Uh, they actually aren't spiral at all. They look like a big giant curse of L. And what they do is the tracks go up and down at varying degrees, thus controlling the speed of the train. Uh, it is an engineering marvel to this day, and we are the only passenger train to run on this route and through the spiral tunnels, so it's really special. Okay, you'll end this rail journey in Banff. Banff, oh gosh, love Banff. This picture depicts not just what I love about Banff, but what I love about the Canadian Rockies. I mean, look at it. Doesn't it look like you're just going to walk down the block and run smack dab into that mountain? It is like that all over the Canadian Rockies. They just surround you. They envelop you. When I'm out there, the only word I can think of, the only adjective that I can use to describe them is majestic. They are so, so majestic. And then if you're going one way, the trip will end in Calgary or start. Again, I'm just talking, you know, Vancouver eastbound. We go westbound as well. So Calgary, of course, home... Um, of the Stampede. Every July, they have the Calgary Stampede for two weeks there. It's kind of a foodie town. It's a kind of a Western town as well. Um, so everything I've talked about has been going one way. So like I said, starting in Vancouver and then flying out of Calgary. But we do have what's called a circle journey. I'll give you a little kind of hint on this. I do a lot of trade shows and almost every single trade show I do inevitably somebody comes up to me and says, oh my gosh, Rocky Mountaineer, best trip I've ever taken, but I wish I would have had more time on the train or I wish I would have gone both ways on the train because as you learned, our train trips are only two or three days long. Um, so we have what's called circle journeys. A circle journey is where you're going to take one route, say that first passage to the West, the red route over to Lake Louise and Banff, spend some time there. And instead of going on to Calgary, you would work your way up to Jasper, spend some time there, and then take another route back. So essentially you're on the train for two days, 
off for whatever, five, six days, back on for another couple of days. So talk to travel leaders about that. They they know the packages that we have. We have one package that's, I think, eight or nine nights long. If you're going to do a circle journey, I recommend probably at least um, 12 days, I would say, me personally, because I think you need to spend time and you don't have all those, you know, one night hotel stays. How you get around when you're in the Rockies, like I mentioned, that green dotted line, um, you get around via motor coach and you do have a driver guide with you. So, you, you know, it's a sightseeing transfers that we are doing. Some of the sites, my favorites are Athabasca Glacier. This is in between Jasper and Lake Louise. So if you're going in between those areas, you can do that. This is where you take this tractor looking thing out onto Athabasca Glacier at the Columbia Ice Fields. This glacier is one of the few glaciers in the world that you can access by a motorized vehicle. Most of them are by cruise ships, of course. Um, when you're out there, I want you to think of this. Think about this. That glacier that you'll be standing on is as thick as the Eiffel Tower is tall. That's amazing, isn't it? As thick as the Eiffel Tower is tall. Also, another one of my favorites is the Banff Gondola. This is where you take about an eight-minute ride up to the top of Sulphur Mountain. Um, you will get amazing views of the Canadian Rockies. And don't just take a picture, turn around, and come back. There's a boardwalk that goes out, I think, about three-quarters of a mile last I kind of tried to time it. And you don't have to go the whole three quarters of a mile, but go 100 steps because every 50, 100 steps, you're going to get a new view of the Canadian Rockies. Okay, so that's our Canadian product. And now I'm so excited to announce our, we are in the United States as well, as we talked about with Kelly. She's going on this with her mother, which I'm so excited for her. Uh, I've been on it twice. Uh, we Last year was our first full year of operating this. We started it in August of 2021. And then last year was our first full year. A little bit of background. I've been with Rocky Mountaineer six years. We've been talking about this for six years. So at least we actually had a whole committee on finding a new route. We searched worldwide. We were very particular. The route had to be able to take our rail cars on it. Uh, it had to have iconic cities, quaint destinations, and honestly, sites that are best seen, not just by rail, but by daylight only multi-day train travel. And I'm telling you, we knocked it out of the park with this one. Rockies to the Red Rocks, Denver, Colorado to Moab, Utah, overnighting in Glenwood Springs. Of course, the train goes either direction as well. So you could start in Moab and end in Denver as well. Little reminder, brought our Silverleaf rail cars down because those two level gold leaf rail cars are um, too too small by about seven inches. So here's just a reminder of the pictures, the nice wide windows, the domed car that goes up about a third of the way and you do dine at your seat with this one as well as the outdoor viewing area. Now, for those of you that want a little bit of an upgrade, we do have Silverleaf Plus. This is in the United States only. Uh, we do not have this in Canada. So this is a little bit of an upgrade in the US. And what Silverleaf Plus does, it gives you access to two lounge cars. One of them is traditional. It has a player piano on board. One of them is a little more modern. It gives you some um, options, too, for additional appetizers and snacks. I mean, trust me, you're not going to go hungry on Rocky Mountaineer ever. But here's some more opportunities to eat and drink on board Rocky Mountaineer. We're going to offer some upgraded liquors, too, maybe a few more premium craft beers from, from the Denver area. I don't really want to call it an, an enhanced dining experience because you are riding and dining in your Silverleaf car. This just gives you access to the two lounge cars. Denver, uh, let's say we're going to start in Denver. I love Denver. Uh, I know it pretty well. I have two nephews that live there, so I feel I know it pretty well. And I, what I love about it, it is a city with culture and diversity, yet it kind of gives a nod to the old old West era as well. So if you haven't spent time in Denver, I do recommend it. Um, in true Rocky Mountaineer form, we go through canyons and you're going to see sites that you cannot see anywhere else. And Gore Canyon is one of them. Uh, you can see Gore Canyon on board Rocky Mountaineer. Or if you choose, you can see Gore Canyon if you're a class five whitewater rafter. I'm pretty adventurous not class five adventurous. Uh, so I quite enjoy seeing it 
from uh, seeing those white water rafters through Gore Canyon from my nice, dry, luxurious rail car with a glass of wine in my hand. Uh, it's really neat. We did see some ra rafters though, and they're very, very courageous. You're going to overnight in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Glenwood Springs is a resort town known for its hot springs. I actually took this picture and I took it and I like it because I wanted to show how close the hotels are. That Hotel Denver, we use that hotel. Where I'm standing is on a footbridge, a pedestrian bridge over the train tracks. And there's another hotel we use behind me, the Hotel Colorado. Uh, those are the main hotels we do use. Um, if we have overflow, sometimes we have to go out a little farther, but these are the main hotels we do use in Glenwood Springs, right there by all the shops and the restaurants. Now, people always ask me to compare Canada and the U.S., and I can't. And here's why. You know, the, the day between Denver and Glenwood Springs reminds me a little of the Canadian Rockies. The day between Glenwood Springs and Moab, completely different, completely different. Um, this is a shot of the book cliffs. They're named because they look like books stacked on a shelf. And they're the longest continuous escarpment in the world, spanning over 250 miles across Utah and Colorado. And we go right past them. Um, also, this is overlooking the Grand Valley. So the Grand Valley has actually become known for its vineyards in the last decade or so. I mean, it's no Napa, but it's still a great area. You're so you'll be traveling through some vineyards and then you're hitting the crimson colored rocks the Red Rocks of Southwest Utah. This is going through Ruby Canyon, uh, which is absolutely, absolutely stunning. And this rail journey, again, two days long ends or begins in Moab, Utah. Moab at the other end is another tiny town, about 4,000 people, but it is a touristy town. So there's lots of shops and restaurants there um, because it is the gateway to Arches National Park, uh, Canyonlands National Park, Dead Horse Point State Park. Arches National Park is home to over 2,000 named arches, 2,000. It is not to be missed when you're out there. The first, I'm going to go back. The first picture I showed, that's a picture of the windows, it's called. This one is called the double O, and if you get it at just the right time of day, the sunlight is absolutely stunning there. Um, I mentioned there's Dead Horse Point State Park, Canyonlands National Park. These pictures as gorgeous as they are and as beautiful as they are, do not do them justice. It really doesn't because these goes, they go on for miles and miles and miles. The only correlation I can really come up with is that think about looking at, a, if you've been to the Grand Canyon, you see a picture of the Grand Canyon and yes, it's big and it's gorgeous, but you get there and you're like, wow, it, it's like that out here as well. So we have different packages. Talk to travel leaders about the different packages that we have. The, of course, all of our packages are going to include the hotels um, and the rail. And then in Canada, they include, include sightseeing packages as well, sightseeing transfers. In the US, um, we do have one package that ha has sightseeing in it, but there's really too much to do in this area. We tried to be everything to everybody the first year we ran. and. You know, we offered float trips. People wanted whitewater rafting. We offered guided hikes. People wanted free time. They wanted hot air balloons. They wanted ATV rides. I could go on and on and on. So honestly, when you're in Moab, there is so much to do. Really talk to your travel leaders, travel advisor about that, and they'll be able to assist with any type of sightseeing. But we have the hotel rail packages. People always ask me, well, Moab, how do you get there? How do you get in or out of Moab? There is, there is an airport with one gate, I'm not kidding, one gate, Delta and United fly in there. So they have connector flights up to Salt Lake or Denver. But we also offer a motor coach transfer up to Salt Lake City. It's about a four and a half hour ride if, um, on a motor coach. To Vegas, we do not do a motor coach transfer because it would be eight hours. It's a six and a half hour drive um, if you were to drive it straight through. So on a motor coach with stops, it would be about eight hours. We have one package I'm gonna talk about in just a minute that does go between Moab and Vegas by motor coach, but you overnight uh, in Bryce Canyon. However, if you are really antsy to get to Vegas and you can't wait to go and spend your money, uh, we offer flight seeing there. So flight seeing is where you take a plane with a pilot guide. It's a plane of about 10 or 12 people, so it's not for everybody, but it is so 
cool. You actually fly over four of the mighty five national parks and it takes about two hours and 20 minutes to get to Vegas from Moab. So think about it. Um, seeing the these national parks, the, the mighty five national parks, you can see them by air, by motor coach, by um, train. So really, really cool. The one package we do have that does a, a motor coach transfer, this is more like an escorted tour or a guided vacation because you will have a travel director and driver with you. Uh, it isn't a smaller sprinter van. It's not the huge motor coach, but it's called our Rockies to Red Rocks at Leisure. And in between Vegas and Moab, uh, you take the motor coach and you overnight in Bryce Canyon. So it kind of breaks it up a little bit. You see Capitol Reef National Park, which is one of the lesser known Mighty Five National Parks, but I've been there. It is not to be missed, not to be missed. Of course, you see Bryce. Um, everything goes down in Bryce. So Ebenezer Bryce's famous quote, I think it's so funny. It's, he said, it's a hell of a place to lose a cow. <laughs> I'm thinking I want to hang on to my car keys <laughs> while I'm there. So everything in Bryce goes down. You'll see everything in Zion goes up. This is a shot in Zion. This is a shot of the Virgin River that runs through Zion National Park. So you'll see that and then uh, heading towards Vegas. When to travel, we operate mid-April through mid-October, pretty much both in Canada and the U.S., um, we do that because of the daylight only train travel. A lot of people think it's because of weather, especially in Canada, they think that a little bit, but more because we want to keep the integrity of that daylight only train travel going. Okay, so that's, that's who we are. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our promotions in the US. Um, basically, there's a lot of words on this. Don't worry about that. It's for both US and Canada. It's on select dates pretty much. So contact your travel leaders, travel advisor, they have access to the agent portal, which will tell them what dates are available. They can call into our vacation consultants and find out what you, what's available. But basically on select dates for our US route, you can save $300 per couple um, on your next rail journey. These are for 2023 new bookings only. In Canada, you save $230 a couple on your next journey. And again, select dates. Um, the offer expires for both of them, February 23rd. Um, those of you that were on a little early, I did a little bit of a, a spoiler alert on this. I can tell you right now, February 24th, we are not going to have a promotion at all. It is not happening. Um, so if you're thinking about booking, now is the time to book. Uh, it, but we just really don't need it. Um, we, we only operate for six months. So these trains fill up. They really, really do. Um, I've heard the next promo is coming out at the end of March. And from what I've heard, that's only going to be for the U.S. route. I have no idea what it's going to be, but it's usually a lesser dollar value. Um, and it's only again on select dates. So, hey, if you have dates that you want, now is the time to do it to, to see if we can get your dates on there. If you've traveled with us in the past, so hopefully you have some people that's traveled on Rocky Mountaineer. If you've traveled with us in the past as a thank you, we offer another $200 per person, $400 per couple off. That is any time. There's no blackout dates for that. And it is combinable with our current in-market offer. So the $300 a couple for the U.S. and the $230 couple for Canada. Finally, um, work with your travel leaders, travel advisors. My gosh, I've been working with these guys for so long and I just love it. I love them. They're so nice. They're so great. Um, what I love about all of them, they're so genuine. They're going to tell you where you want to spend the money, but they're also going to tell you where you can save some money. So make sure you work with them. I will be more than happy to take any questions. Just type them in. And Kelly, if we don't have any questions, which it doesn't look like, um, how can they get a hold of, of you? Yes, so most of you probably already have a travel advisor with one of us, I'm guessing. And if not, you will be receiving a follow up email of the presentation. We can certainly respond to that email. Otherwise, our website is tvlleaders.com and you can connect with any one of our advisors via our website. And I see there is a question that has popped up from Deb Do you stop at Lake Louise? You did cover Lake Louise. 
Yes, great question, Deb. Yes, um, on our, for well, you could go there a couple different ways. So you could take our journey, any one of our Canadian routes can go to Lake Louise and you can spend the night in Lake Louise. If you happen to want to take one of the routes to Jasper, you would take a motor coach down and the packages will, we do have packages that actually include staying at the Chateau Lake Louise. Um, you can also stay there by going on the first passage to the West route. We drop people off actually in Lake Louise, uh, make a quick stop there before heading on to, to Banff. Also, if you don't want to stay at the Chateau Lake Louise, we do have um, sightseeing that will include time at Lake Louise. So yes, you absolutely can see Lake Louise on any of our Canadian routes. Yes, thank you, Deb. All right. If nobody else has any questions, I'll wait just a, another minute or two here just to see if anybody has any additional questions pop up. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. And again, reach out to your travel advisor, respond to the follow-up email that we'll be sending out and let us know if there's anything that we can do for you. Okay, I see Daniel has popped in a question here. My wife is handicapped and cannot walk for long distances. Are these tours accessible? Mm, great question, Daniel. I don't know if you're talking about U.S. or Canada, so I'll kind of cover, kind of cover both. On the train, um, I mean, obviously, talk to your travel leaders, travel advisor about the extent of the mobility, but it doesn't sound like it's it's too bad. It's really just the walking. Um, but yes, on the train, it is not an issue. As I mentioned, the gold leaf would be maybe if she has a hard time with stairs, but there is a lift that goes up and down that she could take. Um, but she would need to use that when she's dining or going to the washroom. As far as the sightseeing, Canada does not have the ADA laws that we do in the U.S. Um, so if she needed something like a kneeling bus, we cannot guarantee that. But if it's just a little bit of a walking issue where she can't walk long distances, that won't be a problem because Pretty much anywhere we stop along the way on the motor coach, there's always a coffee shop or something there that she could, you know, sit and and grab something while people went out, while you went out further, people went out further to explore. And then to add on to that, going from train to hotel. That is included in on Rocky Mountaineer. Was that from him as well or from? Yes, correct. Oh, okay. Okay. Because um, that is, yeah, that is included on that. Um, and again, I would highly recommend because I don't know the extent of the disability, uh, you know, you only have a few steps up to the motor coach. If she does need a kneeling bus, uh, we cannot guarantee that. For example, in Banff, the whole Banff Canadian Rockies area, I believe they only have one kneeling bus, but we will have people assisting. Uh, so getting on the train uh, is not a problem. We actually have ramps that can go up, um, but we have people that can assist as long as she can assist to get on and off the motor coach on her own, then it shouldn't be a problem. But definitely talk to the travel leaders, uh, travel advisor. They're going to talk to our vacation salt consultants and get into the more details of it. And then the final question from him that popped in here is, are there wheelchairs? Uh, we do not offer wheelchairs. Uh, you can bring a wheelchair on. Um, it's not going to necessarily be in the same rail car. And again, that's going to depend too. If it's a collapsible wheelchair, that's not a problem. If she's wheelchair bound with a scooter, then um, you, you, you probably would want silver leaf at that point. It would just be those, those aisles are wider in silver leaf because Obviously, when you go upstairs and the dome goes, the aisles are a little more narrow on the gold leaf. But yeah, talk to talk to your travel advisor about that. And they can call into Rocky Mountaineer and, and get into the details. We'll do our best to make sure that your advisor accommodates you in any way that's needed absolutely. to get you on board that train. Yes, absolutely. For the most part, we don't have many issues at all. So I think from, you know, when he says it, she can't walk very far, it sounds like it should be okay. I don't see any other questions popping in. Again, everyone, and Donna, thank you so much. If this thing inspired someone to head on Rocky Mountaineer, I don't know what would. So <laughs> if you guys have any questions, your travel advisor would be happy to help you and feel free to reach out to us. Thank Great. you, everyone. Have a nice thank day. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.